All right, so we've heard a little bit about rock pool research thus far this morning, and that theme will continue with my presentation, um, but we're going to shift gears to talk more about some of the organisms that inhabit rock pools, specifically mosquito larvae, and some research that we've been working on uh, examining how global warming might affect their interactions with other species, like the predatory dragonfly larvae that you see right here. The majority of the work that I do in rock pools is focused on these guys, North American rock pool mosquitoes. As the name suggests, they are rock pool specialists, using the pools as habitat for their aquatic larvae to develop in, and they are somewhat atypical mosquitoes in that they don't actually need to bite and drop blood in order to lay their eggs. This makes them not only really convenient model organisms for studying, because you don't need to blood feed them, but it also means that they are not typically thought of as vectors for disease. By contrast, the rocks, rock pools also host species such as the invasive Asian bush mosquito, which does need a blood meal, and is a vector for diseases such as West Nile virus. There's some evidence to suggest that they may also be competitors with the native rock pool mosquitoes, they may be displacing them in their natural habitat, and so we're interested in knowing how the two species interact and what a warmer future might hold for them. Temperature in general is very important for cold-blooded animals like our mosquitoes because warmer temperatures generally speed up their metabolic rates. This means that certain things, like the rate at which they develop from their larval stage to adulthood, are often accelerated by those warmer temperatures. We've been able to demonstrate this in the lab for our native rock pool mosquitoes, where increasing the temperature that you rear them at has their development rate, uh, development time rather, from over two weeks at the cool end of the spectrum to just under a week at the warm end of the spectrum. And broadly speaking, what this suggests is that perhaps warmer temperatures may lead to more mosquitoes because they're able to develop and go through their entire life cycle much faster. However, we've also shown that uh, warmer temperatures have costs associated with them. For instance, when temperatures become too warm up at the far end of the spectrum here, the majority of larvae don't survive to adulthood. Additionally, warming has impacts on other species in the system too, such as the dragonfly nymph shown here, which is a predator of mosquito larvae. In just the same way that temperature speeds up mosquito larval development, it also speeds up the rate at which these predatory dragonflies are able to eat mosquito larvae. So we were curious to know how this predator-prey interaction plays out as temperatures warm, and whether the apparent benefit of warmer temperatures for our rock pool mosquitoes outweigh the costs. In other words, we know that the mosquito larvae are developing faster, and so they may be exposed to predators like the dragonfly for a shorter period of time. But given the, the warmer dragonflies are also hungrier, does this actually mean that more mosquito larvae survive to adulthood? So what we did to test this idea, to explore it, was to measure the feeding rates of two different dragonfly nymphs on native rock pool mosquitoes across a temperature gradient and put that together with um, the data I showed before about mosquito development rates in a math modeling framework. In doing so, we can make some predictions about how many mosquito larvae survive to adulthood as a function of temperature. So to briefly recap the development rate data, um, we know already that temperature strongly affects mosquito development rates. Halving the time that they spend, spend developing from two weeks to around one, uh, across the range of temperatures we studied, but temperatures that are too warm um, may kill the larvae. But for the two dragonfly larvae that we studied, both species increased their feeding rates in response to temperature, eating more mosquito larvae at warmer temperatures, shown in the uh, red, than cooler temperatures, shown in the blue. Notably, however, uh, there were differences in how many more larvae were consumed by either species of dragonfly that we studied at warm temperatures relative to cooler ones. The eastern Pontoc nymphs on the left over here uh, consumed about 80% more larvae at warmer temperatures than at cool ones, but the blue dasher nymphs on the right here only ate about half as many more mosquito larvae. 
So uh, just to recap, we have mosquito larvae that develop twice as fast at warm temperatures than they do at cool ones, and predators that don't quite reach twice as many larvae consumed. And so intuitively, based on that, we might think that this is potentially a pretty good deal for the mosquito larvae. And when we take those two pieces and put them together, uh, our model confirms that intuition. The model predicts that the positive effect of that shorter developmental period on the mosquito larvae um, you know, means that more of them survive and it outweighs the negative effect of hungrier dragonfly larval predators um, because the mosquito larvae's exposure to them is limited. However, once temperatures start to get too warm at the far end of the spectrum on both of these plots, uh, you start butting up against the mortality rate issue that I highlighted earlier, and that advantage is lost. So until things get too warm, we predict that warmer temperatures may mean more native mosquito larvae surviving to adulthood, even when predators are present. So just to summarize, what we find is that to understand how warming will influence the survival of prey like our mosquito larvae with the complex life cycles, you really need to look at both the predator and the prey's response to temperature and how that changes the overall interaction strength. We found that for our native non-disease vectoring rock pool mosquitoes, warmer temperatures benefit them because they limit their exposure to larval predators. But importantly, we haven't yet determined whether this is also the case for the invasive disease vectoring Aedes japonicus that is also in our system. This is particularly important because previous work in the system suggests that the invasive larvae um, shown by the blue line here uh, prefer cooler temperature rock pools than the native species, which tends to be found in the warmer temperature pools shown by the red line. And so there's reason to believe that the two species may not respond the same way to temperature. And so this prediction that you will find more um, surviving may not be true for the invasive species the way that it seems to be for the native. Lastly, many other species of animals have complex life cycles with distinct life stages that may differ in how vulnerable they are to predators. Examples range from other insects to frogs and even some fish, which change habitats as they grow. And so these types of warming driven changes in predation may be very important to consider as the climate continues to warm. So really quickly, I'd like to thank my advisor, James Vonish, and the rest of my lab and our larger research group for assistance with this project. Thank you all for your time, and I'm happy to take questions now.